Hello, Canucks fans, and welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation. My name is David Udrelli. Joining me live from Nashville, Harmon. I didn't ask you yesterday. What the hell is behind you? It looks like wall, like really tacky wallpaper that's made of like amplifiers. Like it's supposed to be amplifiers on the wallpaper. Am I seeing that right? Yeah, I think so. It's either that or those old school supposed to be design or artwork of old school boombox speakers or something. It's it's rough, but I'll say this: the hotel as a as a whole is outside of the fire alarms yesterday. It's uh, pretty nice to have. I haven't been able to actually use it because it's mid December, but they had a nice pool there. Uh, the biggest thing is convenience of locations. Two minute walk from the rank, two minutes away from uh, Broadway, and all the buzz there. So convenient location, and I booked through this app that the Athletic. If you book certain hotels, you get Amazon gift cards. So for staying oh. at this hotel, which is a pretty nice hotel, it's I think a four star hotel. I I get like sixty two U S dollars in Amazon gift cards, so I'm like, sure, why not? So okay. yeah, I'll deal with this tacky wallpaper, no problem. Fair enough. So you went to morning skate today, despite being in the heart of Nashville, and we we assume you got after it a bit last night, but you got to morning skate today, uh, and that's where we'll start. But we'll do that in a second. My name is Diego Jolly. That is Harmon Dial. Our technical producer is Grady Sass. And as I said, this is Canucks Conversation. And I need to tell you that today's episode of Canucks Conversation is brought to you by HSBC Sevens. For three full days from February 23rd to 25th, BC Place is going to be the place to be. And that's because for the ninth time, HSBC World Rugby Sevens is coming to Vancouver. Enjoy a next level rugby experience with VIP tickets from just $130 a day, giving you the best seats in the house, player access, a private bar and lounge access, in-seat food and beverage service on top of all of that. HSBC Vancouver Sevens, where high caliber rugby and the ultimate party weekend collide. The ultimate party weekend. Uh, that's what the Canucks are coming off of. And they head into Nashville tonight, Harmon, uh, with Andre Kuzmenko as a healthy scratch. Let's start there. That is the story of the day from Morning Skate, is that Andre Kuzmenko is not in the Canucks lineup tonight. Yeah, a little bit surprising. And I had a chance to talk to talk it after the skate to ask him about the decision to scratch Kuzmenko. And I really don't think that Talkit is trying to send a message. I genuinely believe that he looks at it as Nashville is one of the hottest teams in the NHL right now, and that he needs to, especially with Casey DeSmith starting when you have UC Saros on the other end, that he has to dress his absolute best lineup. And I really believe that with the way Kuzmeko has been trending lately, that he thinks this is his uh, best lineup. Now, Kuzmeko, of course, scored in both the Tampa and Florida games. But after that, after that, he followed it up with um, a quiet Minnesota game where his line was outplayed. The high danger chances were four to one in the Wilds' favor in that one. Uh, the Chicago game wasn't egregiously bad, but I watched some of the shifts back, and we can talk about that later. There were certainly blemishes, and I also think the power play struggles work against him. I don't think the top unit has been struggling because of Andre Kuzmenko, but he's definitely been part of a unit that hasn't been working. Which, if this had been a situation where the power play was clicking, then I think this would have been different where Target would have looked at it and went, at least Kuzmenko's providing me value on special teams and, and we can justify keep keeping him in for, for that reason. Uh, but that hasn't been working. And, you know, Drancer pointed this out this uh, morning that in the 10 games since returning from two healthy scratches in late November, Kuzmenko's got three goals, zero assists, and only 13 shots. And most importantly, Canucks have been outshot 36 to 64 with him on the ice at five on five in that stretch. And you think about what Garland has been able to do on the third line, for example, in a bottom six role. He's playing with Joshua and Bluger, who before this season, everybody would have looked at Joshua and Bluger's fourth line caliber players. Bluger was a healthy scratch for a long stretch of Vegas's playoff run. Uh, you look at Joshua and he played well last season, but again, was mostly looked at as fourth liner. And yet just having Garland on that line alone has been enough for that trio to be one of the best third lines in the NHL this season. He's been able to elevate um, in softer minutes. So yeah, you can say Kuzmenko hasn't had a lot of talent to necessarily play with, but we saw him even with Pia Suter since his return. Um, although of course, Suter last couple of games moved, moved up the lineup a little bit, but the point is he's playing sheltered minutes. And if you're, 
a legit top six caliber player playing in the bottom six, you should be driving the bus. Um, you should be, especially after he had the momentum of uh, a, a couple of games where he scored back to back, that momentum slowed down again, slowed down again. And um, I think it really goes to also show you that, you know, I don't think Kuzminko played badly enough that he had to be scratched, but the fact that he did, I think it really speaks volumes about, hey, there's a real problem here in terms of how the coach views this player and it perhaps not being a long-term fit. Nashville's absolutely rolling right now, and we'll talk more about Kuzmenko specifically, but quickly looking at the game and how it all relates to Andre Kuzmenko and what the Canucks are going with here, I think you're bang on that Rick Tockett feels like this is his best lineup, and that's what he said, and we have no reason not to believe him there. And another thing he spoke about was getting off to a good start against a team like Nashville, who plays fast. You know, Nashville's the kind of opposite of what we've seen from the Canucks lately. Like, they start on time, and they're going to start on time right now winners of their last or thir- their last 16 games i think they've won like 13 of those games um they've won four straight they've just been absolutely rolling um as of late so the canucks are going to need to be ready very early on in this one and i think when rick Tockett looks at the matchups tonight he's probably thinking that okay with uc saros in net it might be harder for us than usual to score a goal now we can't give up goals. So I know what I'm getting with Phil DiGiuseppe at five on five. Like, yeah, he does not have as much offensive talent as Andre Kuzmenko, but he's going to do a better job at keeping the puck out of your end and most importantly, out of your net. So I find that really interesting. um, Talk its answer there. As I expected, the Canucks go with Casey to Smith tonight. We don't need to spend too much time talking about that. I spoke about it yesterday. Uh, I've been thinking this was going to be the plan for quite some time now. So um, I, 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 I was expecting this, and Casey DeSmith does get the start in Nashville tonight. We'll see how that goes. But one thing I wanted to focus on, Harmon, was a question that you asked Rick Tockett at Morning Skate today, and that was about UC Saros and if it changes anything offensively. And one thing he talked about was you have to get the puck off your stick immediately. You can't be massaging the puck is the term he used, and you need to be quick because he's a quick goaltender. If you give him time to set, he's probably going to make the save. What did you think of that answer, and what did you think of it in re- regards to Andre Kuzmenko, who you would expect would be someone normally that could get the puck off his stick in a hurry against a goaltender like this? Yeah, I think it's it, it is an interesting point for Taka to make in terms of being decisive about your shot selection because we have seen over the last, even though the Canucks have won, there have been situations over the last couple of weeks where sometimes they'll pass up prime scoring positions and we'll look for that perfect play. And you can understand why against a hot goaltender like Saros, you might be looking for that extra pass to really bury it. But sometimes that extra time looking for the play, you get checked. Somebody hops into the shooting lane. We've seen that even on the power play, for instance, where that's perhaps um, been an area where Tockett has wanted more of a shot first mentality. So I can understand it. Although with Soros playing as well as as well as he is, you're just going to have to create a much higher volume of scoring chances because in the Minnesota game, for example, good for them for grinding out the the point thanks to in large part to Casey DeSmith, but they didn't generate a whole lot at all at even strength. And in the Chicago game, the second period they took over, but we saw the first period as well. The Canucks didn't get a single even strength shot. So for me, Yeah, part of it is, okay, when you are in those locations, you have to pull the trigger. But I think the Canucks have work to do to make sure that they're actually in those prime scoring locations in the first place. And that, to me, starts with being able to exit the zone proficiently because if you're able to exit out of your zone cleanly, I've noticed that that's an X factor for the Canucks being able to activate their forecheck. And I've crunched some of the numbers since December 2nd. Nearly half of their 5-on-5 goals have occurred within five to 10 seconds of a successful forecheck where they're able to force a turnover and they're immediately able to pounce. And the reason that's so effective is because the defense on the other team doesn't have a chance to protect the middle because they're in a position to try and support the breakout. They're thinking, okay, we have the puck. We're ready to transition up the ice. Then the Canucks dominate the boards and they're able to create havoc around the net. That's what they need to do more of to generate offense against Saros and make sure that they're actually getting on the inside for looks. 
Philip Ronick moves up to power play one. Uh, I found it interesting when he spoke at Morning Skate, Rick Tockett mentioned that he has some experience playing the bumper spot in Detroit. How much did you see from the power play at Morning Skate today? Yeah, uh, Hronik was getting a lot of looks in the bumper spot, and I think a big part of the logic behind that is Miller is probably the most important piece on that power play. He is an elite, elite playmaker, and he's at his best when he's setting up chances and shooting from that left half wall side. We saw Kuzmenko getting more opportunities from there, and of course the first goal that he scored last week to get off the schneid uh, was a one-timer from there. So I think part of getting Hironic in the bumper is, okay, now we really want Miller to be able to get a lot of touches as a playmaker from that left side. And yeah, that means we're not going to be able to use Hironic's one-timer from there as often, but Miller is, to me, the most dangerous threat on the power play, and you want to put him in a position to succeed. Okay, uh, we will get to a lot, lot of really good interaction in the YouTube live chat, so we'll get to that uh, in a bit here in our Anyone Else segment. But before that, we are going to bring in our pal, Jeff Patterson, who is brought to you by Greta. Right on my hat. The home of our electric watch parties, Greta is Canucks Army's spot to catch the game throughout the offseason playoffs and also our place to chill in the offseason. Speaking of those electric watch parties... We don't have dates just yet, but we're, we're, we're throwing around some, and we're going to be having another one soon, folks. Uh, it is going to be a lot of fun, uh, and you won't want to miss it, so we'll have more details there. Greta is the place to be. Look at this. I got some play cards from Greta. I don't know if I'm going to be giving these out to people or what's going to happen, but I got a lot of play cards. I got my merch on. I am ready to go. Uh, we need to get Jeff some Greta merch as well. Uh, I wonder if Jeff is going to make an appearance at our watch party. Let's let's bring him in. Let's bring in Jeff Patterson. Uh, Jeff, what's your what? favorite arcade game? Watch parties, uh, Donkey Kong, without a doubt. I uh, was always a huge Donkey Kong guy. I don't know if that's still a thing, but Donkey Kong was my, my game. Uh, you look like you've done your Christmas shopping with all those gift cards. And unfortunately, watch parties and rink-wide postgame don't necessarily mesh perfectly, but you know, maybe you make an early appearance before puck drops or something like that. Maybe you do rink wide live from Greta. I don't know, Jeff. I don't know. You, you're going to have two co-hosts there. We'll throw it around. We'll throw it around. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. But Jeff, thanks for doing this today. Uh, obviously, Harmon's on the road in Nashville. So we got a lot of our morning skate updates from him. Let's start there. Uh, Andre Kuzmenko, a healthy scratch tonight. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's unfortunate that it's come to this uh, so quickly again. I was hoping that uh, the message had been sent with the back-to-backs in Seattle and San Jose, but really there hasn't been an awful lot to his game since then. And in fact, uh, he has dropped lower in the lineup. Uh, and I think that the minute that Pia Suter came back, we knew that there were going to be difficult decisions. And I think Rick Tockett deferred to uh, Kuzmenko last week when Suter came back, like you could have taken him out that night, but I think they went with the rookie or second year guy in Nils Amon, uh, you know, and that wasn't going to create a lot of waves and wasn't going to get a lot of attention. Uh, but eventually, I mean, PDG over the weekend, and here we are. We're back at this point in time where, you know, Kuzmenko's not a fourth line guy. We know that. And so he's not producing in the top six. The punishment has been to drop him lower in the lineup, but he's not doing the things that Rick Tockett wants from uh, a fourth line. He's got two hits on the season. I, I just, for my own curiosity and a little bit of amusement, I, I went back game by game to find the two hits. Now, maybe Rick Tockett's missing out on an opportunity because one of them came in that Halloween game against these very natural predators. So <laughs> maybe it's the sight of the Preds uniform that like gets Kuzmenko fired up, but uh, he had a hit on Dante Fabro that night. The other one was uh, on the road in Montreal. Uh, with a hit on Mike Matheson. So there you go. You're welcome. The research has been done. Those are the two hits for Andre Kuzmenko this season. Now, again, that's not who he is. That's not his game. But if you're playing him with not particularly skilled players, and I say that with all due respect to anybody that's in the National Hockey League, but if you're on the fourth line with Nils Amon and Phil DiGiuseppe or Sam Lafferty, who's fallen back down there, Rick Tockett's got some expectations. And it's just evidently clear that that's not what you're going to get from Andre Kuzmenko. And they tried to, you know, throw him a little bit of love by keeping him on the first unit power play. I, I was blown away this morning when I went back and I see that the tweet has sort of taken off because I don't think anybody had realized he doesn't have an assist. An assist, whether on the power play or it evens since November the 15th against the Islanders. So, so much focus on his lack of goal scoring. But this is a guy that has some playmaking to his game as well. And 
I'm just amazed that there's not a, a second assist somewhere on the power play in there uh, that he didn't touch a puck that wound up on the stick of, you know, Hughes or Miller or, or Patterson or Besser, the way that he's going. So uh, I'm a little surprised, but also, I mean, so yeah, like what is his contribution to this lineup? They're still winning way more than their share of hockey games without him, whether he's in the lineup and not playing much or uh, coming right out of the lineup again here tonight. So it's a conundrum. I wrote about it two weeks ago at Canucks Army, and I, I just reread the piece. I mean, you know, I, I asked then how long can the coach and the player coexist, and really nothing's changed. And, in fact, you could say they're further down the road here. So, uh, you know, the Canucks have enough in their lineup. It's not about uh, needing the 39 goals that he scored last year. It's about him finding ways to contribute. And if you look at a, a Nils Hoagletter, for example, guys, I mean, it's been the inverse. He started the season in the press box, worked his way onto the fourth line, and with his hustle and determination and persistence, he has played his way higher in the lineup. And so, uh, again, you know, nobody's freaking out about Connor Garland and his two goals because you get an honest effort from him every single night out, and it's the hustle, it's the winning the board battles, it's you know possession, it's keeping the puck in the offensive zone. And with Kuzmenko, you know, just time and time and time again, uh, there isn't enough in his game. So I'm not surprised, but this isn't great for a hockey club that's had so much success this year to sort of have this black cloud hanging over them and everybody asking, what are you doing with this guy that's making five and a half this year and five and a half again next year? Jay Pat, the other sort of area where his absence is, is going to create change is the power play. Uh, morning skate today, they used Philip Peronic, meaning two defensemen on the unit. He was taking some reps in, in the bumper spot with JT sort of um, stationing the left side of the power play. Do you think two defensemen can work? And considering it's been struggling as a whole, what are you looking for them to show uh, to be successful over the next little stretch? Yeah, I'm a little curious about a right shot in the bumper. Maybe that sets up Elias Pettersson on the other side to feed the middle of the ice. But we know how much success JT Miller had sending pucks into the middle for Bo Horvat as a left-hander last year. Now, if you're Heronic, you're not going to be facing JT Miller. You're going to be looking the other way. So uh, I sort of need to see a little bit of success here for them to, to prove that this method can work. But I'll give them every opportunity uh, because generally Heronic's... Uh, addition to the power play has been a heavy shot that either scores or, you know, creates loose change and, and rebounds uh, for others to, to poke home. So uh, I'm not a huge fan of the three forward, two defenseman set, but again, it speaks to this, you know, if you don't have the goal scoring Andre Kuzmenko of a year ago, uh, it exposes that area of weakness that this team needs one more legitimate scoring threat as a forward. And then you could swap Kuzmenko out and put that player in, but they don't have that player. So they're trying to get by now, bigger question about the power play. You know, it's funny because the results are there. They're five Oh and one in their last six games, but in those six games, I don't know if people realize Quinn Hughes has found the score sheet once in those six games. And it was, three assists the night that uh, Besser had the hat-trick against Tampa. So if you just look, he's got three points in his last six games. Not terrible, but in five of those six games, Quinn Hughes has not produced a single point. And I'm not concerned, but what I will say is, if you think back to the first 10 or 15 games of the season on the power play, the power play was lights out good. And so much of that was Quinn Hughes just launching pucks from all angles and causing chaos in front of the net. And it was resulting in all sorts of power play success for the Canucks. They had a lot of player movement, but I think the central theme there was Quinn Hughes had found this shot of his and wasn't afraid to use it. His shot totals have dropped. I mean, they're 32 games into the season. If you just go on 16 game splits, he almost shot twice as much in the first 16 games as he has these past 16. Like, get back to that. Let Quinn Hughes do his thing that, you know, what makes him so effective. And if other teams are shading to him now and starting to take that away, like I think he's creative enough to find ways around that. But uh, I just, that power play in the early going, I mean, it won them a ton of hockey games. Teams just didn't have an answer for them. And they've looked pretty predictable. They've looked a little slow. Uh, puck movement has been great. Guys have had trouble controlling the puck. I like the pass from Miller to ba uh, Pedersen in Chicago the other day. But I want to see that power play get back to being an absolute game breaker because I believe that the talent is there that the component parts are there, but uh, really the last 10 or 15 games, power play has kind of been stuck in the mud. 
feels like deja vu because the three points in six games for Quinn Hughes was the exact stat that we were talking about last week on your hit before the Tampa <laughs> Bay game. We were talking about how it was exactly uh, that same stretch for Quinn Hughes. So that's interesting. Um, Casey DeSmith gets the start tonight, Jeff. Uh, any surprise there? I know you did rank wide with me and I was touting that this was going to yeah. happen. Uh, any surprise there with Casey DeSmith getting the start tonight? A little, just the fact that Demko is coming off a week in which he was 4-0 and was the second star of the week and had the shutout not that long ago. Was he great in Chicago? Not necessarily, but a couple of power play goals and there were breakdowns in front of him. But what I like now is that it's so clear that Rick Tockett and this coaching staff as a whole and this organization has the confidence that Casey DeSmith isn't just giving Thatcher Demko rest here. Like, they believe in this guy, and they haven't sheltered him. If you think back, second game of the season in Edmonton after the Oilers had been shellacked 8-1, to one, now Demko was under the weather, and so their hands were forced a little bit there, but he went in, he delivered, uh, you know, got a start in Florida on that road trip, faced the Rangers. We know the kind of season that they are having, and here, this Nashville team. Like, I'm excited about this game tonight. Like, great challenge for the Canucks. It'll be a good challenge for the Preds, just because of the season the Canucks are having as well, but for Casey DeSmith to walk into uh, Bridgestone Arena, Predators have won 13 of the last 16. They're not giving up much, but they're scoring. In fact, it, it, this surprised me yesterday. I was just doing a little bit of research. Uh, since November 18th, no team has more wins or points, and only one team in the league has scored more goals than the natural Predators. You don't think of them as a high-scoring operation, but Philip Forsberg's having a terrific season. That line with O'Reilly and Gus Nyquist, uh, they're producing a lot. North Van, shout out. To, uh, we always like to pump North Van. Uh, Colton <laughs> Sissons, is, uh, he had a dozen goals last year. The guy's at uh, uh, 10 before Christmas, so not quite on the Brock Besser plan, but uh, he's having an incredible run as well. So this is going to be a challenge for Casey DeSmith and the Vancouver Canucks, but they had the day off yesterday to rest up. Uh, we didn't like the slow starts necessarily on the weekend. I know Rick Talk talked about that after the morning skate. I, I think the players are well aware of uh, the problems and the, you know, the the challenges that Nashville poses. So I'd like to think the skaters are going to be ready in front of Casey DeSmith. But we saw that even if they weren't in Minnesota the other day, that uh, he was up to the challenge then. And just look at that. Like his last two starts, both against the Minnesota Wild, the guy's given up one goal. One goal in those two starts. It's incredible that he doesn't have two wins. But, you know, that's life in the National Hockey League. Uh, whatever the case, he seems dialed in. Uh, and the fan base seems to be pretty confident. And when was the last time you could say that about, uh, you know, a backup getting in there? And not just, again, giving Demko a night off. It's about a backup getting in there and giving them capable and competent goaltending that gives the Canucks a chance to get this victory here tonight. Jay Pat, the Canucks have won five of their last six, despite there being things that haven't necessarily gone the best. The Canucks haven't maybe played their A game recently when we talk about uh, Kuzmenko, the power play, the starts. Uh, even Quinn Hughes hasn't been quite at his Norris level, and yet they continue racking up wins. What's been most impressive about this recent stretch and, and why they've been able to have some success? And Brock Besser to the rescue every night, it feels like. I mean, honestly, his consistency, though, right? Like, he has the hat trick. He doesn't uh, score in Minnesota, but he just kind of felt it was a matter of time before he got one against the Blackhawks, and so his run has been incredible. Uh, I like the spread scoring the other day at United Center, that it, uh, you know, really getting goals from three different lines. You could draw through line, that third line, certainly, and just how reliable they have been during this stretch. And so, yeah, if Quinn Hughes isn't necessarily delivering here over the last couple of weeks, you know, in the last few years, if that was the case, I don't think the Canucks had a chance to win, but they've got other guys that are picking them up. Uh, you know, earlier in the season, we said a little too reliant on the power play and the five on five scoring bit of an issue. But, uh, you know, the other day in Chicago, uh, they get three or four goals uh, at even strength. So I like that. Uh, I just think it's been the depth of this team. And in fact, the, you know, the, the addition of Nikita Zadorov and the depth that they've got on the back end as well. So, yeah, maybe Quinn Hughes hasn't been at his very, very best. But, you know, that pairing with uh, Zadorov and, and Myers, to answer your question, Harm, in these last six games, like, I think we all thought that that was just going to be an absolute carnival and wildly entertaining to watch with, you know, these two giants on defense. And for the most part, they seem to have stabilized each other somehow, some way. Who knew that Nikita Zadorov was going to have that effect, a calming effect, uh, on uh, Tyler Myers, but, you know, just really quietly, they've been very, very effective. Obviously, Zadorov stepping up to defend Elias Pettersson the other day, and I think, uh, you know, that's an element that they've been missing for the last little while. It's not going to do that every game, but uh, it's just that when the Stars haven't had their very best, there have been enough 
sort of spot duty performers stepping up into the breach. And that third line right now is just so fun to watch and to see them getting rewarded finally. Uh, the hard work's been there. The offense hasn't, but uh, the last, what are they? they're all on a three-game point streak right now. Dakota Joshua seems to be feeling it. And uh, where I thought Pia Suter would get plugged right in to that line at some point upon his return, uh, I don't think you're touching that line with Teddy Bluger in the middle. So uh, they've been fun to watch, and I think they've been a big part of this 5-0-1 run. Jeff, great stuff as always. Thanks for doing this. All right. Uh, looking forward to it, as I said, because I think this is going to be a good matchup. I'm looking forward to the Dallas game as well. These are good tests for the Vancouver Canucks. And, uh, you know, they pick up three or four to start the road trip. So even if they can get a split, if they can win one of these last two, they guarantee themselves five of eight points. If they get a win in Nashville, you know, then you step into the ring in Dallas, you take your best swing. And boy, that could be a, an incredible road trip for them. But one at a time, the Preds, I'm sure, will give the Canucks all they can handle tonight. One at a time and one rink-wide Vancouver episode at we'll a time. Thanks for doing yes. this. Yes. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and as I said, you can go check out Rink-Wide Vancouver post-game. Uh, Jeff Patterson with a string of hosts, one of which uh, is Irfan Gaffar, who is going to be my co-host in studio uh, tomorrow. And people were asking in the YouTube live chat what happened to our set. Harmon's in Nashville. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, so I'm staying home and, and doing the show from home. But I'll be in studio tomorrow. Uh, with Earth, yeah, the sun's setting too, so you can just progressively <laughs> see my room getting darker and darker and darker. And the problem is, there's no ceiling lights, so like I can turn on some of my lamps, but that doesn't really do anything for the lighting. <laughs> At least you got that Amazon gift card, my friend. At least you got that. Um, okay, so what do we have here? Okay, sorry, before we get to anyone else, we need to get to light the lamp brought to you by our friends at four winds brewing vancouver is playing tampa bay tonight and we want to know who's going to score the first goal for vancouver if you nail it you could win a 25 dollars gift card to the four winds tap room located at 72nd and river road in delta enter by following us on social media keep an eye out for today's show clip and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army or at Canucks Convo on Twitter, at CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure you ask about the Four Winds Light light Lager at your local liquor store or have some delivered to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. Uh, I am going, keeping it safe, I'm going with Brock Besser tonight. Damn it, I was going to pick him because I want him to get 25 goals before Christmas. Uh, by the way, you, you said Vancouver is going to play Tampa Bay. And last week you said they were going to play uh, oh Anaheim. So get your head in the game, quads. But no, and uh, in all seriousness, I'll take, I'll take Connor Garland then. He's been feeling it. He deserves an extra goal here or there. All right. I like it. I like it. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Sorry. That threw me off. I hate when I do that, but anyways, old script from last Tuesday's game. Uh, so let's move on. Let's move on to anyone else. So it's time for another ad read. Wish me luck here. Uh, it's time for anyone else presented by DoorDash, our listeners chance to get involved in his up in the YouTube live chat. It's also our listeners chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they enter the code nation 25. That's all capital letters nation and the numbers to five with restaurants grocery pharmacies bakeries flower shops and more doordash really has everything you need to make the holidays special use that promo code nation 25 for 25 percent off your first order with doordash offer valid in canada subject to change terms do apply last night i ordered dinner on doordash and i tried to use the code but i already have an account so i wasn't able to use it but first time users make sure you go use that code uh, a lot of really good interaction in the YouTube live chat. It's the second day in a row where we've got uh, quite a bit here. Gee, I wonder um, what player everybody wants to talk about. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Andre Kuzmenko questions. So I'll set you up uh, with one here. I like this one. Uh, let's just start right here, Harmon. Jeremy Lee, what is the ideal return for Kuzmenko if Alvin makes a trade? Well, I think the main thing you have to keep in mind is that because he's got term left, a, a team that's taking on his contract is probably going to want to send you a contract back. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a bad contract they send your way, but it's it could be a, a contract that, you know, maybe it's a position that they have an excess of players at, 
or they just don't like the player of that fit on on that roster it's going to be that type of return i'd be really surprised if there's a team that is willing to take on the entire contract not because kuzmenko has that bad of a contract because he scored 39 goals last year nor do i think the canucks would be in a position where they have to give up a sweetener but i imagine it would it would be perhaps another change of scenery type uh swap if you're trying to get it done mid-season it's a different story if you're doing it in the offseason when teams have more space when the cap's going to go up that's when you probably have more uh, options to leverage a kuzmenko trade to just free up cap space but if you're going to do it mid-season then yeah I, I do think it's going to have to be sort of another contract coming back and honestly i mean if you are if you are making that type of swap it at this point, would it not be for another forward? And the reason I say that another forward top nine potential is because now the Canucks are in a situation where you've got Pia Suter playing on the top line, which I don't know if that's going to be a long-term fit. Uh, you've also got Nils Hoaglander. As much, and as much as I like Nils Hoaglander, I don't know if Tockett is going to trust and keep him there for the entire season, right? So if you remove Kuzmenko from the equation, you're probably short at least the top six uh, winger. And it, you know, again, I don't know how practical or real it is. If another team has another, you know, top nine forward, let's call it, um, that they want a better stylistic fit um, may not be realistic or possible, but, you know, I wonder if, if you are sort of looking at it being another forward, just because, you know, with the Zadorov trade and once Carson Susi comes back, it's, I mean, maybe you could look at a number six, D-man upgrade for Juleson. Now that I think about it, um, you, you could always use more depth on the blue line. But the overall point I'm trying to make is uh, you're just going to have to try and identify a contract that the other team is perhaps looking to give up and that you think is a better lineup fit for what Talkett is, is trying to do. Uh, Grim Studio, jeez, my bad. Grim Studio asked, uh, Kuzmenko for Tyson Berry, would you do it? No. Uh, I'm saying no. Yeah, okay, I'm saying no as well because uh, Tyson Berry, look, the reason he had so much success in Edmonton was because he was playing on that top power play unit. He's not getting power play time uh, in Vancouver, maybe not even on PP2 uh, once Philip Peronik eventually goes back down to that second power play unit. So no, I would say no, that is not the one that you want to make. People are just throwing names in the chat. I love it. Alex Campbell. I'll let you ask this one, Harmon. Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi for Andre Kuzmenko. Would you do it? Bertuzzi has been really good for them lately. Hasn't he? I was looking at, um, I mean, he had a really slow start, but I think he'd recently, like I'd seen the underlying numbers with him, Tavares and Nylander. I don't know if they're still together at this point, but I think he had found traction at some point. And you also got to remember that, Brad Tree living the way he wants to construct construct his team. He wants more of those sandpaper type players. That was the whole idea of signing Bertuzzi, of signing Domi, of signing um, Ryan Reeves. And the Leafs aren't the best defensive team right now at five on five. So I don't know if bringing a player in Kuzmenko who has more skill, but is probably more of a liability from a two way perspective is what Toronto would be looking for. I like this. I like this. A lot of people throwing out trade proposals, but uh regular listener here, Logan Van Dick jumped in the chat and said, Koozie for no one. It's a sophomore slump. Give the kid some time. And that's just it, right? Like Jim Rutherford has spoken already last week about how their preference is for Kuzmenko to figure it out. This scratch though, Harmon, I just, yeah, like I just look at it and say like, this has to be toward the end of the Kuzmenko saga in Vancouver. Like, it feels like we have to be moving toward a resolution. Obviously, there's the trade freeze, and I don't think the Canucks are going to trade Kuzmenko uh, within the next 13 hours before that trade trade freeze kicks in. I don't know. Like, what, what, what ultimately, what do you think happens here, Harmon? Like, do you think he's dealt in season? Do you think he's dealt um, in the offseason? Or do you think he finishes out this season and he plays here next year as a part of the Canucks top six. I know it's hard to answer, but like, what do you think if you had to guess? Well, it, it sort of depends on what type of trade opportunities the Canucks have at their disposal. And I'm obviously not privy to that because the other thing you have to keep in mind is who plays power play one. And, and I brought this point up 
uh, many times before. And I know that Kuzmenko hasn't necessarily been clicking there recently, but when Andre Kuzmenko is on his game, the one area that you know he can be effective is the first unit power play. And the Canucks don't have an obvious forward that they can plug into that, into that spot. That's why they, they're going to use Philip Peronik there. Uh, now, and let's be honest, there just aren't many teams in the NHL that are running three forwards and two defensemen on a power play. So when you look at how important that man advantage is for Vancouver, like that's something you have to be mindful of. And, and same thing with the top six. Again, at some point, like they've they've been fortunate that Lafferty and, and Hoaglander have been able to play well. But if those guys are all of a sudden you know, start like their offense starts to slow down or, or let's say one of your top six players gets injured. Then all of a sudden you've got a forward group that at the top of the lineup looks pretty thin. And then you may be going, Oh, we could really use Kuzmenko in an offensive capacity. So it's, it's interesting because on the one hand, I look at it and go, I would not want to trade Kuzmenko right now, just because it's the lowest ebb of his trade value. And I do think that, you'll see him rebound at some point, at least offensively. And yet I can also look at the situation and say, clearly, I don't think this is a long-term fit. So at some point you're going to have to likely pull the trigger. Thought provoking answer as always a lot of people in the YouTube live chat. And I'd love to get to everybody. Give me 10 seconds to open the curtain. Cause literally it's pitch black in here. It is pitch black. It's very funny. Um, one that I found interesting in the chat here is just that, Sniper brought up, what if they traded Besser when he was struggling? We know he can score. Of course, talking about Kuzmenko and talking about Brock Besser uh, in the past. And I find that one to be an interesting kind of perspective on it all. Because, look, like Brock Besser came in and he was somebody that, or excuse me, when Rick Tockett came in, Brock Besser was somebody who improved his game and by the end of the season said, I want to be here. So, Sniper, while I do agree with you, and Harmon, I'm just reading the, the comment from Sniper here where he said, what if they traded Besser when he was struggling? It, it's a little bit of a different situation because Besser's situation improved when Tockett came in, whereas Kuzmenko kind of did the opposite, right? Like, it, it seems like Kuzmenko was a better fit under Boudreaux, whereas Besser wasn't quite as good of a fit. Uh, under Bruce Boudreau. So it's it's a little bit of a different situation, but I do understand what you're trying to say. It's it's an interesting uh, kind of point to bring bring up there. Well, I also just wanted to add, like I think that's probably the strongest case for at least holding him until the end of the season. Yeah. Again, in the summer where you may have more trade options at your disposal, but the key difference I think between Besser and Kuzmenko is that Besser had at least at earlier points in the season shown that he can be a capable defensive player. And what I mean by that is in the shortened 56 game season, for instance, the year where Pedersen missed half the year with injury uh, where that was the first year Miller moved to center as well. And he was below a point per game, not quite at his best. Besser scored 23 goals in 56 games. Besser was their best forward. And one thing that stood out is in stats data showed that he was one of the best forwards in the NHL at winning puck battles. That was statistically proven. Does Kuzmenko have that in him? I don't think so because, well, yes, they're both similar in that they lack foot speed. Besser's bigger and he's certainly not the most competitive player, but I do think he's a step up from Kuzmenko in that department. So, yeah, I do think there's a difference there in terms of defensive and two-way upside where Besser had at least shown that he could hold his own in a two-way matchup role even when the lotto line was put together in 2019 20 that a big part of that line's identity wasn't just pretty passing plays off the rush it was creating chances off for off uh, turnovers on the four check which besser was often sort of the f2 um making him making an impact there we'll see we'll see what ends up happening tonight um I, this is gonna be a bigger conversation so i'll save kind of I don't know. This whole thing just got me thinking about like Philip Peronik and how well he's playing statistically right now, uh, you know, just with the raw counting stats, like goals, assists and all that sort of stuff just got me thinking about that. And, you know, Nikita Zadorov and just extensions and how the Canucks management regime could maybe avoid a similar misstep where they extend a the guy when he's playing as, as well as Kuzmenko was last year. And, you know, 
I don't know. I, I don't think it'll happen again because I think you'll have you have that organizational alignment that they just didn't really have last year. Like Kuzmenko's extension came right when Talkit was hired, right? So it wasn't like Talkit was consulted too too much about that extension. So uh, again, I don't know if there's a lesson to be had there, but it's something I want to give a little bit more thought to before I start throwing it out there, uh, which basically I just did. But anyways, I want to give it a little more thought before I make it kind of a uh, hard take there. But we'll wrap up anyone else there and get to our betway bet of the day brought to you by our friends over at betway pull it up there grady um canucks are the underdog tonight in nashville it's all about a good start it's all about a hot start tonight that's going to be something you have to watch it's something that talk it highlighted at morning skate today so our betway bet of the day is the vancouver canucks to win the game in any fashion a ten dollar bet at plus 100 odds returns you twenty dollars over on betway it must be 90 plus to play if you choose to play please play responsibly Harmon, do you like my pick do you like that see i'm not a vibes guy i can't tell you on a night to night basis if they're gonna win or not that's what you're good at so i'll i'll trust your judgment and and go with that because I, you know what? It's weird. I've never, for better or for worse, really had strong vibes about like tonight's game. What's going to happen? Like I might, I definitely have vibes in terms of like 10 game stretches, right? Uh, because it's a longer trend and I can lean on process, but I've just, I'm not a vibes guy when it comes to a game to game basis. I'll give you some vibes here. Uh, Nikhil wrote this for his Betway Bet of the Day over at Canucks Army. He wrote about Elias Pettersson and his pure domination of the Nashville Predators. Uh, just the, the guy is, he just he, he destroys the Nashville Predators every time. Uh, they play nine goals and seven assists in 12 career games against Nashville. Uh, he's been picking it up lately. I like that. And his only hat trick of this season, if you recall, was against those same Nashville Predators. I don't know if you can call them the same Nashville Predators based on how they're playing as of late. Uh, but Elias Pettersson, there's uh, there's there's reason to believe that he's going to be very, very good tonight in Nashville. And I think I'll be able to tell you within the first five minutes of the game if the Canucks are going to win this one or not. What happened with the vibes yesterday, Quads, with your uh, Red Wings and over pick? You oh, went we don't talk and, about that. You went oh, against yeah. your wagon ducks. I know. You committed one of the sins of betting. If I that had with picked your head, the, not with your heart, if I had picked with the reverse of that bet where I did, okay, over five and a half total goals and the ducks win one, I would have gotten better value on that. So it would have returned more money and it would have been actually correct. And look, I, I was actually going to throw out some takeaways from that game because I did watch that. game. Oh, wow. I was going wow. to throw out some takeaways. Uh, one takeaway is that Pavel Mintyakov guy. Oh my gosh, he is going to be a problem. Like he is going to be a problem in the league. I think he's got three points in his past two games or something like that. Uh, he's starting to, his, his point production starting to match what he's doing on the ice. Um, also, Adam Henrique is going to be the number one guy at the trade deadline. And hey, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe the Canucks go out and get him. That's a play driving winger. Put him with Elias Pettersson. Adam Henrique is going to make some team very, very happy. What, when you and J-Pat had that conversation on friday about the canucks contention to win here um one of the things i think we have to factor in is a team like the ducks not being in the basement anymore and pushing into those either those three spots or one of the wild cards in the future and then on the flip side like you could make the case you know vegas might come down but uh yeah the pacific division la is going to be there with you know guys like brant clark and we've seen how well quentin byfield has done so that's always something you got to think about, not only where the Canucks will be, but where those other teams in the Pacific as well. And man, though that Ducks decor they got coming up with Zellweger and uh, Warren and uh, some of the other guys they have there too, they are loaded. Okay, this is too much Ducks conversation even for me. Yeah, who's the number not one Ducks, Ducks conversation. Fan. Number one Ducks fan over here. Uh, yeah. We'll it was all it those Mighty Duck movies as a kid, wasn't it? Never seen them. Never seen what? Mighty Ducks. No, never. Harmon, have you wow. seen this? No. Oh. Yeah, see? <laughs> Come on. Anyways, we'll the move chat's on. The going right to roast there. you guys. Anyways, Whatever. I'm we'll end here. the chat. We'll end the episode. We'll end the chat. They can't. They don't have time to roast us. Uh, we'll close it out there for my co-host, Harmon Dial, whose room has gotten progressively darker <laughs> as this episode I look like I'm being on. held hostage. <laughs> Talk about the ducks right now. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, Harmon Dial. My name is Dave Gugelli. Uh, our technical producer was Grady Sass. Uh, this has been 
Canucks Conversation. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads every weekday at 2 p.m. Be sure to check it out on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. And if you missed it, go check it out on your favorite podcast catcher app.